All right, let's get to uh, what we're doing tonight, shall we? Tonight we have a very, very, very special program lined up for you. It's going to be a lot of fun because we have we have uh, Ruben Yarte and Nori Torres. They're going to be joining us. We got some special guests lined up for you, and they're all coming live from Roswell. And whenever we come back from the break, I'm going to play something for you immediately after the break that uh, you're going to want to hear. It's pretty damn cool. Stick around. It's Badlands Radio. Thursday night. I'm your host, Captain Jack. And by the way, get this. On our website, we have the uh, listing of the, the 50 most powerful talk radio shows on the internet. Badlands Radio, Paranormal Radio Show Studios, is number 26 out of 50 of the most powerful talk radio shows on the internet. Now you think, okay, Jack, 26? You're 26 out of 50? Come on, you're still right there in the middle, right? A little below middle. Alex Jones is right above me. But the fact that we made number 26 out of 50 of the most powerful talk radio shows on the Internet, to me, that is a monumental task, considering the names on the list. It says we're doing something right. Stick around. This is Badlands Radio. I'm your host, Captain Jack, as always. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Late this afternoon, a bulletin from New Mexico suggested that the widely publicized mystery of the flying saucers may soon be solved. Army Air Force officers reported that one of the strange disks had been found and inspected sometime last week. Our correspondents in Los Angeles and Chicago have been in contact with Army officials endeavoring to obtain all possible late information. Joe Wilson reports to us now from Chicago. The Army may be getting to the bottom of all this talk about the so-called flying saucers. As a matter of fact, the 509th Atomic Bomb Group headquarters at Roswell, New Mexico, reports that it has received one of the disks which landed on a ranch outside Roswell. The disk landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico, and the rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Rancher W.W. Brizel was the man who discovered the saucer. Colonel William Blanchard of the Roswell Air Base refuses to give details of what the flying disk looks like. In Fort Worth, Texas, where the object was first sent, Brigadier General Roger Ramey says that it is being shipped by air to the AAF Research Center at Wright Field, Ohio. A few moments ago, I talked to officials at Wright Field, and they declared that they expect the so-called flying saucer to be delivered there, but that it hasn't arrived as yet. Mexico border, two of them. There was the reported 1955 incident near Del Rio, Texas, where... Colonel Robert Willingham, who is a living witness, uh, he's in his 80s now, said that uh, when he was an Air Force uh, Reserve pilot in the 50s, in 1955, that he saw a UFO crash land just south of uh, Del Rio, Texas, along the uh, border there. Yes. And so that's, uh, that resulted in our recent book. And then we also have investigated the 1974 incident, which uh, UFO researchers have called Mexico's Roswell in which a uh, UFO had a mid-air collision, so the story goes, with a small plane uh, in the area of El Paso, Texas, uh, actually down closer to Presidio, Texas. Right. But really, the, the, uh, in, uh, among, in UFO circles, the big event uh, all harkens back to the 1947 event uh, here in Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, it's kind of the granddaddy of, of all crash retrieval stories. And we are just uh, very happy that uh, joining us tonight is the person who first brought to light this incredible story, and that's Stan Friedman, that's who's right. with us here tonight. Um, he he can take us back into history and give give us tremendous insight because he was the first UFO researcher to look into this fantastic story, and he's here with us, Captain. That's fantastic. Um, here's something that's very interesting. Now, I played the audio from the original, uh, one of the original radio broadcasts about what they were saying. Uh, the, the disc has been recovered. The Army has it. They have this. 
Now, of course, we know that the last explanation from the government was that it was Project Mogul. And one thing that I find incredibly interesting about the whole Project Mogul and them saying that's what it was is that the Project Mogul program itself was top secret. The technology behind it was not. And ranchers would find these little device boxes on their ranches all the time. All the time. And there was even an outstanding uh, thing. If you bring in one of these boxes, you get a reward for it. So ranchers were doing it all the time. So for them to send out to the, to the ranch uh, an entire team of people to go over and, and shoulder to shoulder and look for, for every ounce of material they could over a Project Mogul balloon seems ludicrous to me. Stan, right. tell me about this. You're right, it is ludicrous. Uh, the Air Force has felt perfectly free to change all the data. Uh, if you look at the press stories that went out on July 8th, evening papers from Chicago West, yes. uh, too late for the uh, East Coast papers and for the morning papers across the country, but uh, from Chicago West, all of them say found last week. This is on July 8th, mind you. Yes. Yet suddenly the mogul explanation... They brought in the rancher, they feed him a new story, uh, and now suddenly we're talking about June 14th or so. That is not last week from July 8th, no matter how you slice it. Right. Uh, the second thing is, if you look at the characteristics of the mogul junk, <laughs> it was all conventional stuff. The weather balloons were standard neoprene weather balloons, the right. kind you used to be able to buy in a surplus store. Right. Uh, nothing special about them. There were uh, some ballast containers, a radio transmitter. The only thing highly classified was the purpose of the project. Exactly. And there was nothing anywhere that said anything about that. And that was to try, and I emphasize, try to develop a constant altitude balloon that would, from thousands of miles away, hear the sound waves produced by a Soviet nuclear explosion. Yes. Now, it's an indication that the stuff wasn't classified. They often let the trial balloons, <laughs> sorry, uh, come to rest on the ground and be left alone. They yes. weren't picked up. Right. Highly classified, they would have picked them up. Right. It would have been chase planes with all these things. <laughs> right. There weren't any. The particular uh, launch that they say uh, explains it uh, has been shown not to even have been launched for weather problems. And if you look at their d discussion about things, it just doesn't fit. There's no way it could come over there. Yes. Now, first to talk to Major Jesse Marcel, they stressed that there was nothing conventional out at the debris field. Nothing. He'd seen crashed saucers. He'd handled weathered balloons. He had a course in radar, which included radar um, reflectors hung on standard balloons. Right. Ranchers had recovered balloons. So there was nothing sophisticated about this, about balloons. What Jesse told me, this is way back in 1978, was that there was nothing conventional out there. In other words, there were no propellers, there were yes. no rivets, there were no radio uh, devices, no wire, uh, no, no vacuum balsa tube. wood. It, well, there wasn't any balsa wood. Right. Uh, there's one of those things where the nasty, noisy, negativist take a, a few liberties. Right. What, he, what Jesse stressed was that the stuff was light as balsa wood. There were two standards, heavy as lead, light as balsa. Yes. Everybody at that time knew what balsa wood was. The kids made models. Jesse Marcel Jr. made right. models from them, but he did. So he didn't say they were made of balsa wood. It was as light as balsa wood. It's the only thing you could compare it to. Right. And so... People and also the foil material. If you look at the pictures taken in General Ramey's office, it's paper covered or foil back paper or paper back foil, depending on how you look at it. That any three year old could tear. There was nothing strange. It was supposed to be really strong. The I beam like pieces you couldn't break, couldn't burn, couldn't cut. Now, all the junk in the mogul stuff was easily broken, easily taken apart. It was lightweight because how much can a balloon lift? You That's know? right. And so. Mogul fails the test. The materials were not incredible. Uh, there's no launch that fits. The timing was wrong. The witness testimony must be 
uh, paid attention to. Remember, we're talking about Major Jesse Marcel, who was the intelligence officer for the most elite military group in the entire world, mm -hmm. the 509. They yes. dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, That's right. two more nuclear weapons in Operation Crossroads the previous year. Uh, we're not talking about a bunch of dinks with nothing better to do than That's make right. stories. I, I like one of the uh, critics, the head of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, scientifically trained by having three degrees in English, mind you, <laughs> who claimed that, uh, oh, the whole Roswell story was this inexperienced PR guy who made up a story to get attention. Uh -huh. I said, you don't even know his name, do you? Well, no. I said, I've known him for 20 years. He was not inexperienced. Oh, that was more than 10 years ago, right here at the museum. I was here, and he was out in California. Yes. Now, just earlier this year, in an article in the Skeptical Inquirer, uh, he repeats the same nonsense. An unauthorized press release from an inexperienced press person. That's incredible. was authorized. There's no question that uh, Colonel... Blanchard authorized it. Yes. Walter Hawk would have been in the brig, you know, in two minutes if he put out something like that. <laughs> That's right. That's absolutely I mean, right. you know, it just makes no sense. That's right. Uh, to say he was inexperienced, he wasn't old, but he had more than 20 missions dropping bombs in Japan. Yes. That makes him kind of experienced, it seems to me. He was a good enough bombardier to be chosen to drop the instrument package in one of the nuclear weapons tests in Operation Crossroads in '46. So to call somebody like that inexperienced is absurd. Yes. I mean, this wasn't a guy who walked in off the street from some PR agency, hey, we need some help with PR, why don't you take over? Right. That's not... And when you really start incident. looking when you really start looking at this at this case from, from from beginning to end, it's clear, it's obvious that what they found, what they said they found in the beginning is exactly what they found until someone said, wait a minute, what the hell? You're letting this all leak out. we got to contain this, and we got to contain it fast. Well, I talked to the man who was right in the middle of the containment. I, there's a picture, a famous picture, of General Ramey and Colonel, at that time, Thomas Jefferson DuBose in Fort Worth, Texas, in Ramey's office. And I figured that, well, gee, maybe he was a West Pointer. I knew Blanchard was dead, and I knew Ramey was dead, but I checked with West Point, and son of a gun. Bose was alive. Yes. He told me roughly where he lived. Now, it was Florida, but he was only down there in the wintertime, as you can imagine. But finally, I caught him on the phone. Right. I met with him in person down in Florida. And he told me, three feet away from me, he was in his 80s, but he still had all his marbles, I'll guarantee yes. you that. But he was sharp. He took the call from General Ramey's boss, General Clements McMullen, who was the acting head of the Strategic Air Command. Ramey was head of the 8th Air Force, which was part of the Strategic Air Command. So DuBose was West Point, Ramey was West Point, Blanchard was West Point, and McMullen was West Point. These guys all knew each other. Right. And as uh, DuBose put it, McMullen was a crusty old character, and he gave him three orders. He said... I want you to get the press off our back. I don't care how you do it. Second, I want you to send some of that wreckage up here today with one of your colonel couriers. Uh -huh. I don't want you ever to talk about it again, not even with your buddy Roger Ramey. That's an order. Do I need to put it in writing? No, oh, sir. What else does the colonel say to a two-star general? There wasn't a question of identification here. They knew each other. So when you hear that story, you have to say, well, wait a minute. Here's a guy who was later a retired general. He set up the Air Force's search and rescue team. It's a responsible job. Mm -hmm. At 18,000 hours as a pilot, mm -hmm. I talked to him about a lot of different former Air Force guys just to get a sort of a feeling. Was he still connected in his head with reality kind of thing? He was in his 80s. And there's no question he was in his little anecdotes and so forth. Talking about some of the women out at the base, we kept that out of an interview. With <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, well, there is a DVD... First-hand recollections of Roswell. First-hand testimony from 27 Roswell witnesses. Yes. And if people are going to say something, they ought to listen to the testimony of the guys who were there. Yes. And most of those people are dead now. You can't go back and re-interview. That's them, right. No and they're, 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 they're leaving us fast, in fact. Uh, we're racing the undertaker, and we're losing the race. I mean, yes. it's inevitable. You know? yes. So his testimony is extremely important. 
And so is the testimony of other witnesses who were involved. We have people here in town, uh, Judd Roberts at the local radio station. Mm -hmm. We have other reporters and stuff. And so when I hear the Air Force really foul things up, that's a nice way of saying they lied through their teeth, <laughs> it aggravates me. Uh, their, second, their first explanation for bodies uh, is, is one of those fascinating ones, crash test dummies. Yes. We did our homework, and we found we were dropping crash test dummies all over the country, and in their report, they show the same map. We're all dropping all these things. Yes. It's funny. None of them were dropped near where the Roswell event took place. Right. And furthermore, I talked to the man who was head of that program, Colonel Madsen, retired. I talked to him. Uh, and he told me there were two important factors. One was for the test to be meaningful. See, pilot planes were flying higher and farther and faster, and how do you get a pilot out if he needs to eject? You want to run some tests on the equipment without real pilots there. Right. But it has to be meaningful. The crash test dummies had to be six feet tall and 175 pounds. That's right. How in the world do you morph that down to a four-foot bull guy? That's right. And there's also this, inc this very curious... Uh, Information that came out about the the caskets, the child size caskets, isn't there? Uh, yeah, I, I was the person that Glenn Dennis talked to about that stuff, and uh, you know, what do you do? Throw out all this testimony, and say everybody's lying, and you say what for? Right. Fame and fortune. There was no fortune. There was no fame. That's right. It's infamous as soon as you start talking about flying saucers. <laughs> so. Uh, if you look at the, the good books on the subject, not the stuff from the nasty, noisy negativists who talked to nobody and just reiterated the same old lies. Yes. Uh, you know, it, well, a typical lie. In the first volume that the Air Force put out, Roswell Report, Truth versus Fiction in the Mexico Desert, the Air Force provided the fiction. Yes. They lied about me. They lied about uh, Colonel Marcel, uh, several other things that they lied about. And they also lied in saying, this is our last word on the subject, a thousand-page report, mind you. Well, a couple of years later, they put out the second volume. Uh, closed, the Roswell Report case closed. Right. That's the test. Now, now, what are you supposed to say when you find out that none of them were dropped until 1953? You got time travel for crash test dummies. <laughs> yes. Or in size, and they were moved in space. I wish I know how to time travel, and I'm not a crash test dummy. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's compounded. The worst part about this story is the way it was blindly accepted by the New York Times and the Washington Post and these other guys. It's almost as if the rule is look, if there were anything in flying saucers, we would know about it, and it would certainly be important if they were visitors from outer space and if the government was covering up. But we don't, so it must not be, and we're not going to waste any time getting acquainted with the facts. It's circular reasoning, in other words. That's true. Perpetuating a myth. That's true. And that's what they want. And so it, it bothers me not only to be lied about in official government reports, which get the basic data wrong, mm -hmm. but to create an image throughout the media, throughout the world that... Oh, they've explained it. It's all taken care of. There was nothing to rise. Well, you can understand the cover-up in 1947. They didn't fully know what they were dealing with. They could hardly go public, and the world was going to hell in a handbasket. Half of Europe was starving. Right. Cold War had heated up. The Marshall Plan was just starting. What are you going to say? Oh, we thought you'd like to know that they're alien spacecraft violating our airspace. We don't know where they're from, what they want, how they operate, who they're working with on this planet. But we thought it would make you feel better to know that. Yes. You couldn't. Exactly. 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 So I understand that cover-up, and today there are other reasons. But what I don't understand is the repeated lies from the nasty, noisy negativists. And lies is what they are. The colonel who wrote the, the big report... Especially, as it turned out, I did some checking, was disinformation. Huh. And boy, that's an appropriate title for what he put out. Exactly. You need to understand that the government has lied, will continue to lie. There's no other case that they've had anywhere near this much about. Two big volumes. One isn't enough. Two. And even the, the guy who was in charge of that crash test stomach program has gone public with saying that he's misrepresented in the report. And it's funny, I found him and talked to him. Why did the Air Force talk to him with their big investigation? They yeah. got money. 
So it, it, it's a sad day. I'm glad uh, that Roswell, at least, is getting the benefit from the government's cover-up, considering that they closed down the base here without any decent reason other than they didn't vote for Lyndon Johnson here in the 64 election. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, that's not exactly a good reason to drive the town of its major source of income, which was sure. the people who worked. So it seemed very appropriate that the festival brings millions of dollars to Roswell. That's they right. They deserve it. They That's earned it. Though. Absolutely <laughs> true. All right, we're at the top of the hour. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to talk about the conferences going on there because from what I understand, there's several going on in all locations around uh, Roswell there. We'll talk a little bit about that and we'll dive even deeper into Roswell and, of course, other crash retrieval historically documented cases. We'll be back after this. Badlands Radio. I'm your host, Captain Jack. It's 2 a.m. The fear is gone. It's 2 a.m. The gun is still warm. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Late this afternoon, a bulletin from New Mexico suggested that the widely publicized mystery of the flying saucers may soon be solved. Army Air Force officers reported that one of the strange disks had been found and inspected sometime last week. Our correspondents in Los Angeles and Chicago have been in contact with Army officials endeavoring to obtain all possible late information. Joe Wilson reports to us now from Chicago. The Army may be getting to the bottom of all this talk about the so-called flying saucer. As a matter of fact, the 509th Atomic Bomb Group headquarters at Roswell, New Mexico, reports that it has received one of the disks which landed on a ranch outside Roswell. The disk landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico, and the rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Rancher W.W. W. Brizel was the man who discovered the saucer. Colonel William Blanchard of the Roswell Air Base refuses to give details of what the flying disc looks like. In Fort Worth, Texas, where the object was first sent, Brigadier General Roger Ramey says that it is being shipped by air to the AAF Research Center at Wright Field, Ohio. A few moments ago, I talked to officials at Wright Field, and they declared that they expect the so-called flying saucer to be delivered there, but that it hasn't arrived as yet. You're listening to 99.9 FM KVMP. In Central Texas. Welcome back, everybody. Here we are, Badlands Radio in the black, deep black heart of Central Texas. I'm your host, Captain Jack. Tonight's program is uh, is a very special one, actually. The Roswellian Experience 2009. We've got some special guests in here tonight, of course. Nori Torres, Ruben Yarte, and uh, Stanton Friedman. And of course, of course, so we cannot forget... This lovely, lovely lady, Julie Schuster. She is the uh, museum director, the Roswell Museum director there. And, uh, you know, a lot of people may not know this, that her father, her father, um, Walter Hunt, was the public information officer at Roswell. He, of course, noted, he's noted for issuing the famous news release that the Army had captured a flying saucer. Yes, I bet you didn't know that. Well, maybe you did. <laughs> she she's put everything together there. She does a fantastic job every every time, and uh, she too is joining us. And uh, I'm going to start off with you, Julie, to uh, tell tell us a little bit more about uh, this year's event and uh, past events, and uh, just bring us up to speed for those who are crying right now that they couldn't make it there. <laughs> they are missing an awesome event. I believe we have that. more. And work harder, run the legs off of Stanton, Noe, and Rubin, along with a lot of other authors and researchers. They kind of become slaves to the tables, I think, here. And, but we provide a lot of information. It's just, it's wonderful. Yes, yes, indeed. You know, um, the, the last two years, last two years, I have planned and planned 
to be out there. And ever, it's like the forces of the universe are working against me that keeps me away from there. I think the last time I had Stan on, as a matter of fact, uh, I was like, Stan, I'll, I'll probably see you out there. I'm going to be heading out there. He's like, great. What happens? Oh, I get grounded. I think my staff keeps locking me in my office. I think, I think they do it on purpose. That's what I think. But, it, <laughs> but everyone that has been out there has had a fantastic time, great speakers, and this year is no difference, is there? There's like several different um, events going on all over town, isn't there? Yes. Um, there are other events, there are other activities going on. You know, the big one that we have with the city of, in the city is uh, Mike Satterfield Fireworks Extravaganza. Our fireworks display on Saturday night is just awesome. We've had people here in the past that have live out in California and said it beats, rivals anything they see at their big fireworks. I agree fireworks. with that. <laughs> so, that's our, our citywide big thing, and it is it is a wonderful event. Um, yet, you know, I really deal with what happens within our walls, yes. and beyond that, with other events, I don't have a clue because I, you know, all of these gentlemen know that about three or four times a day, I'm going looking at them, going, "Who are you?" <laughs> yeah. I could imagine. I can imagine. Now, how many people um, yearly, actually, well, yeah, yearly travel just through the museum itself? We average about 155,000 people a year wow. through, from all over the world. Wow. Wow. And, of course, you get an opportunity to talk to some of them, uh, maybe some of them even visiting for the first time, probably even learning about everything for the first time. Um, has there anything over the years that, stands out in your mind that, that really shocked you or really brought some joy to, to the information and, and the stuff there in the museum? You know, standing out is, you know, an incident that was, to me, well, I will never forget is coming back from lunch, and it has really nothing much to do with getting more information here, but it was just one of the um, things that always pops to my mind coming back from lunch one day and this lady's out in front of the museum talking to people, heavy English accent. Uh -huh. And she says, do you work here? And I said, yes, ma'am. Can I help you? And she said, well, there's that's a bunch of hooey in there. There's nothing to it. I said, well, you're welcome to your opinion. Um, you know, but please don't disturb the other visitors coming and going. Yes. And I came into work. The lady at the greeter's desk was just chortling. She thought it was funny to say, she said, did you talk to her? I said, yes. She said, you want to know the other side? I said, yeah. She said, her husband's been in here for three hours reading everything on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> That's why she was so upset then. <laughs> and outside in front, because she won't come in, and he's been in the date, and I bet you he was thoroughly enjoying being by himself. <laughs> I, could have, I'm, I think you're right, Julie. I do think you're right. Well, it's fantastic oh. stuff. And, and, and just before the break, Stan said something that is absolutely absolutely accurate is that Roswell has deserved this after after all the different reports after all the different cover-ups after after discrediting so you know trying to discredit the the uh, the residents of Roswell the witnesses to what exactly happened on that day in 1947 Roswell definitely definitely without a doubt has deserved this attention you know, when the base closed, it was devastating. I mean, over half of the community left. Yes. And we went from about 25 civilians and about 20 to 25 military, 1,000 military, and half of them left. Yes. And we had housing that just went, the housing market went to heck in a hand basket. You know, they're just, it, it was devastating. It took many, many, many years for us to kind of recoup and get back to some semblance of normalcy. Right. And, so you know, we just kind of plotted along until um, Stanton opened his mouth and started talking about the, <laughs> to getting people to talk. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm the original civilian director of the uh, investigator of the Roswell That's incident. Right. I was not here in 1947, Don. <laughs> That's not clear. But uh, it, it's, there's no question. I, I've lectured all over the world. Everybody's interested in Roswell. They asked me about it in Australia, in China. Mm -hmm. Heard of Roswell, and most of what they've heard is good, because I suppose they've heard of stuff in their own countries, but that hasn't been publicized much. And so they're pleased to see somebody taking the lead, namely Roswell, 
and get the word out that this isn't nonsense. It's not garbage. It's the real world. Yes. And, you know, well, I can't emphasize too much that Roswell was the most elite military group in the world, the 509. Mm-hmm. And General uh, Colonel Blanchard went on to be a four-star general. He was vice chief of staff of the Air Force. He was uh, before that. Uh, he was the head of operations for the Strategic Air Command. Right. Thousands of nuclear weapons under his control. We're not talking about nuts here. We're talking about very serious, highly responsible people. That's right. Never been ashamed to be connected with Roswell because it's solid. Yeah, there's garbage out there. I can't help that. All I can do is put the facts out on the table. That's very true. Now, let me ask you, sir. Uh, Ruben, Noe, and Julie, have, has, have you ever heard the story of how Stan got interested in Roswell? I have. You have? Well, I hope. Has. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, real quick play. I'm, yeah, I'm at a story. television station in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, promoting my lecture that night at Louisiana State University. I'd done two out of three planned interviews. The third reporter was nowhere to be found. The station manager out of the blue tells me, you know, the guy you ought to talk to is Jesse Marcel. And being the brilliant investigator I am, I said, who's he? And, but he said, floored me. He said, oh, he handled records of one of those saucers you're interested in when he was in the military. What? Now, and that was the beginning. I called, uh, the reporter showed up, and the next day I called Jesse from the airport. Not his story. I heard a second story at a lecture in Bemidji, Minnesota. My colleague William Moore had a third story that we could pin the date down on. Uh, found the articles in the newspapers at the University of Minnesota Library. In other words, people, people didn't come running to us. Right. We spent an awful lot of money and time over the next year and a half locating 62 people in conjunction with right. this event. In 1986, it was 92 people. And this is before the Internet. It wasn't so easy to find people back then, in other words. That's true. And sure, we got lucky. I called the newspaper and said, I'd like to talk to the editor from 47, long gone. What can I do for you? And so I have an article here that says the base public information officer, I didn't even know the base had been closed, a guy named Walter Hutt, and before I could finish the sentence, he said, oh, his wife works here. What? <laughs> you don't expect the GI to be in the same town where he was 30 years ago in a small town. Yes. And that... Got us access to Walter, and he had a base yearbook, and we worked our butts off to find other witnesses. They didn't come running to us, right. contrary to the, out by the nonsense peddlers. You know, it's really interesting, too, because um, the, the cover-up, of course, and this has been widespread throughout uh, the military of anyone that has anything to do with UFOs whatsoever, is the standard the standard practice of saying, you know what, don't talk about this. You cannot talk about this. And a lot of guys okay. are worried about things like their pensions and things like this, doing interviews about what they know about UFOs. But 19... Well, you know, 19- Jesse, Jesse couldn't deny his involvement. His picture and his name That's were right. in papers all over the world. That's right. And the same with Colonel DuBose, whom I found. His picture was in the newspapers. He couldn't say, oh, I had nothing to do with that. Well, and, and there he is in the newspapers. So... Uh, the early people, Walter Hunt's name was in the newspapers, Colonel Blanchard's name. Mm-hmm. So none of these people, Blanchard was dead already by this time, but could deny involvement because it would have been so clearly a lie. That's true. And so it's been one of the good things that we started with some of the best people and, uh, you know, a little past their pension time maybe, but uh, who, who could complain? I mean, these were straightforward people telling the truth, backed up by the newspaper's current stuff. We have a, a, an FBI memo, stuff like that. So it's a solid case with solid people. We're lucky as I, well, if you go to my website, www.stantonfriedman.com, you'll see this DVD with 27 first-hand testimonies. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of first-hand testimony. That's true. Uh, and, you know, wh- what do you do with that? You're going to say everybody's a liar? Plenty of other evidence about flying saucers, but Roswell certainly is up there with a ton of evidence. That's true. And now, ni- 1947, I mean, that th- this really is an, a, a, a marking event of how the military actually started to handle crash retrieval, which I want to go into uh, the Mexico's Roswell a little bit, because Ruben and Noe, you guys are the ones that, that broke this. 
the the similarities, um, but actually also seeing how the military, from the, the information that you uncovered, how the military had refined not only its recovery uh, operations, but also its oh, its uh, blackout of, of, of information to the media was very contrastial. That's absolutely true. Uh, this is Noe. We're saying goodbye to Stan Friedman. We're so thrilled that he was able to join us for a little bit. He has another engagement that he's off to. Okay. So we appreciate him being with us. Thank you so much, Stan. Um, and Julie has to get back to uh, finish the uh, evening's act- activities here at the museum. Absolutely. Anyone who might still would be within uh, range of coming to the UFO Festival, I might add, uh, it's going on through this Sunday uh, here in Roswell, New Mexico. It's always held around the, the, four- the weekend of the 4th of July. It starts on Thursday and runs through Sunday of, of the, the weekend closest to the 4th of July. And it's a uh, it's a spectacular event as we've been talking about. Um, Ruben and I uh, have been very uh, privileged to be invited to speak for the past three years. Yes. And uh, it's an extremely uh, important event. So everybody's welcome who is thinking about or is in the area uh, of Roswell to attend either this year's event or future years, of course. That's right. Uh, one of the neat things about coming here is that those of us who have been working on other cases um, similar to the 1947 Roswell event uh, can kind of uh, compare and contrast where our research has taken us with the great, the vast uh, storehouse of information that's available here at the UFO Museum, including a very large library that they have here for UFO researchers, just volumes and volumes of information. They take great pride in the, in the library research uh, that they make available here to the UFO community. So we're really certainly happy about uh, Julie providing that service to the community and, and the museum board as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're we're thrilled. But uh, that's one of the important things I think is that we come here and we connect with uh, we connect with other UFO researchers and we talk about the similarities and differences between what we're working on and uh, this landmark case that we've been talking about so far tonight, which is uh, one of the most important, if not the most important, UFO event in human history, uh, the 1947 crash of an object here near Roswell. That's absolutely, absolutely true. That's absolutely true without a doubt. And, and like Stan had pointed out so well that this, this area, the, the, the Army personnel that were involved in the recovery of this it wasn't some Beetle Bailey operation. I mean, these guys were very intelligent. They knew what was going on in the world. They fully knew um, that whatever it was that they went and recovered, because like the, like with the news report, uh, the broadcast that we played here, um, it, it, they're saying it's a disc. It's a disc. So where would they be getting disc from if it was just a mogul balloon? That's just ludicrous. And anybody anybody that looks into this case can see the major holes in the story. Uh, can you hear me there? Maybe we'll, uh, Kevin oh yeah, Jack. did we uh, lose you a little bit there? This is uh, Ruben here and uh, something that I wanted to share with you, actually this is probably the first time I've ever had a chance to just share it publicly. But publicly um, as Noe was indicating that you know this is the, the Roswell event is, is is the big granddaddy of them all, and and that's what basically stems uh, for us to uh, get involved in our research. And it, it and Roswell keeps coming back. Um, you know, I'm also the director for uh, MUFON for Northern California. That's right. And a couple of years ago, um, we had a very interesting situation that arise. We got a call uh, by a young man who claimed that his father was uh, was involved in military intelligence and that. And the fact that he had uh, basically, um, uh, before he died, his son said, well, what is what are one of the things that you most regret doing? You know, and his father was in World War II. Uh, his father was um, um, involved in a number of, of, of operations and, and 
U.S. Army Intelligence. He said, I, the biggest regret, this is what he told his son, was the fact that, um, that in his, in his, uh, that he had basically had threatened a 12 year old girl and her mother, um, that they were to keep quiet about, about a UFO crash in Roswell. Yes. And he had said that. That's, that's what, uh, what, that's what the father told his son. Well, basically, he, had, he uh, his father passed away, and I remember, um, of occasions seeing the various uh, eyewitnesses that were involved in Roswell. Frankie Rowe, she was a woman. That's right. That would, when she was 12 year old, that when she was 12 years old, remembers the military coming up to her home, threatened uh, that they were to keep quiet, they were not to say anything, or they'll wind up being up somewhere in the desert. That's right. Their bodies would found. It's a big desert out there, is what he said. Exactly. Well, the fact that this man, this this young man, was saying that his father was involved in this case, um, basically, what we did was we set up an interview with Miss Frankie Rowe. We had photographs and that, and uh, there were two things. One, it, it, this carried a lot, a lot of. Uh, there was a lot of um, um, weight on this young man, uh, basically, because this is what he, his father, was involved in. And he remembers this. And secondly was a lot of weight on, on Frankie Rowe as well, you know, remembering this. Mm-hmm. So what happened was that we, uh, I had some photographs, some photos, and I uh, had shared them with Frankie. And basically, unfortunately, that was like almost 60 years ago, and uh, she couldn't really identify the photographs. But this is something that's still out there that we're, we're continuing to, hopefully, maybe we could find, again, you know, get more some background information. But... I think the the biggest issue is when we get cases like this, we're getting getting connected with more military uh, people that were involved in the military from back then, mm-hmm. and then trying to substantiate their uh, their, uh, their involvement. But it's, it, we we tend to come back to to Roswell, and uh, and I'll share something later on uh, as we go in our interview okay. uh, that connects with our other case, uh, the Mexico's Roswell, the other, uh, the other Roswell, the case with Colonel Willingham. Yes, yes. Um, it, it keeps coming back, and then and, uh, they're, uh, you don't finish. I, <laughs> there's never a conclusion. This is, this is something that, uh, that we're, we're trying to piece together here. The more, the more answers you get, the more questions surface, in a sense. Uh, Captain, I want to add here that we, this is our third time that Ruben and I have been to the UFO Festival here at the museum in Roswell. Uh-huh. And we are amazed every time we come at the... There's just a, kind of a sense or a presence here in this town. Well, first of all, the folks are extremely friendly, to, and, and they go out of their way. The whole community goes out of their way to host uh, those of us who come in as their guests. Right. But... There is a feeling that something very important happened here, and it's associated, of course, that feeling is associated with with the reports from 1947. Uh, everybody senses that there is a place and a time in history where something very critical and pronounced happened here. Yes. This is the physical place. This is the, the place. It's something that you... It's very hard to define in words. Uh, we've heard Stanton Friedman talking about, you know, with the how it impacted the whole community and how it has over the years. But there's some presence or point of fact here that just will not go away. And to this day, as you walk the streets of this community, as you talk to the local people, everybody here is impacted by this presence or this connection with the past, with history, with this important event that happened in 1947. And I, I challenge uh, your listeners, those of, of your listeners who have not been to Roswell, New Mexico yet, this is a special place. And That's right. I challenge you to come here and feel what it's like to walk these streets, to uh, go to the hangar, at the, at the, uh, which is open to the public uh, during special tours, uh, to go to the hangar at, at the old Army uh, air base here, just north of Roswell, where uh, people say that the bodies uh, from the crashed UFO were taken, That's and right. just the thing 
that just kind of overwhelms you there. There's something special here that has not gone away low these 62 years. That's right. That's uh, and it's right. still here. I mean, so many uh, beliefs and theories and, and fads come and go in our society, you know, from year to year. But this is one belief, one connection to the past that seems to just go on forever. And uh, that's what's amazing about it. And, and, and you can feel it here. You can feel it in this town and you can feel it in talking to the to the folks here. That's right. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll, uh, also, oh, oh, go ahead. I uh, wanted to throw something in real quick. We get people from all over the world, and uh, I'm just amazed. Uh, we had one woman that came from Argentina. She took a bus and traveled all the way just to come here. Oh, wow. Wow. That is, and we were just totally blown away by that. Today, uh, for example, I interviewed, uh, well, there were some people that came up to me, and she said, do you speak Spanish? I said, yes. It says we're from Peru. <laughs> I said, "Oh, well, welcome!" And <laughs> it was a whole family. There was a whole family, and um, you know they're very, very interested in what was going on here. And of course, there's a lot happening in Peru, but it's amazing. Uh, we're sitting there and in the tables and meeting people from all walks of life yes. that are interested, curious, and some of them have their, some of them may have the answer. That's true. Their loved, you their know, loved ones. You know, I remember I remember this very clearly because my father was at Kirkland Air Force Base in Albuquerque. And I remember just being a little kid and sitting out on the steps of our house. And I don't know how old I was young, but I remember him telling me about Roswell. He told me about Roswell. And I can't recall how he knew the information, but he knew it from the beginning to the end. But he was in the military. He was in the Air Force at the time, so I'm sure, of course, that stood out in his mind. And this is this is 19, I would say, 76. So I think I was six or seven years old, something like that. That's what got me on my path. We're at the bottom of the hour. We're going to take a quick break here. When we we'll return, we'll pick up where we left off. So stay right where you are, everybody. Badlands Radio. It's Thursday night, and we'll be right back after this. Welcome back, everybody. Here we are, Badlands Radio. We've got uh, Noe and Ruben here, live from Roswell. If you're just tuning in and uh, you're just uh, catching up to us, well, you miss Stan and you miss Julie. Stanton Friedman and the uh, lovely director out there at the museum in uh, Roswell. They uh, busy, busy people. That is for sure. And uh, so now, now, it's a trio. Me, Noe, and Ruben are going to dive really deep, not only into Roswell, but crash retrievals, uh, well, in our past, and even currently probably going on. Let's take the Needles California case, for example. Interesting. Interesting indeed. You know, there is one aspect, you know, whenever... whenever we played the, uh, the the original news uh, radio broadcast about uh, what the army said that they had. And they specifically said a disc. Specifically said a disc. Now, that says something to me that says that they really had a disc on their hands. And, of course, the government has come out and said, no, 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 it's just Project Mogul. Well, then there was the case of the bodies. Then they tried to say they were crash test dummies. But there is something very interesting about the fact that suddenly the base out there was ordering in some caskets fit for children. Very small caskets. Very interesting stuff. Noe, Ruben, welcome back. Yes, thank you again thank you. for having us. We're uh, very excited uh, every year to come to Roswell. It's kind of a time when we can reconnect with folks in the field and hear about uh, a lot of amazing information that has come to light, uh, you know, since the last time we, we were here. And um, one of the interesting things that we have going is that Ruben and I have uh, done two books, uh, both about crash retrievals that are very similar to the Roswell 1947 case. Yes. And uh, people come to our table and, and they come and listen to our lectures here at Roswell, New Mexico. And there's that uh, linkage that we make. Uh, we were talking about earlier how in each case there are certain unique characteristics that, that we could point to and say 
you know, this seems to be what the military later decided um, should be the standard operating procedure for handling these sorts of things. Yes. The cool thing about the Roswell 1947 case is that those procedures had not yet been put into place. Right. But there was kind of winging it, so to speak. And unfortunately, Stan Friedman had to leave us here. Uh, there was some kind of mix-up with his luggage, and he actually hasn't received his luggage oh, no. yet. Oh, no. Even though we all mm. arrived, uh, we arrived here in Roswell, you know, a day or two ago, most of the researchers, but Stan arrived without his luggage, and the airline doesn't seem to be able to turn up his luggage. Maybe some aliens got a hold of it. Really, yeah, <laughs> some, some guys in white vans going through the stuff. <laughs> yeah, but I was thinking that if Stan was here, he could further uh, help me with this point. But the uh, interesting thing is that um, the standard procedures for handling UFO uh, cases, the disinformation campaign, ridiculing of the witnesses, uh, coming up with explanations that hold no water whatsoever, but if they're delivered with enough uh, sounding credible enough, then perhaps people will buy it and, right. and ignore them. These sorts of pattern of behavior that we saw consistently in the middle to late 50s and then from that point onward had not yet been fully put into place July 1947 when suddenly, lo and behold, in the middle of what a lot of people considered nowheresville, New Mexico, uh, at that time very small population, you know, uh, all of a sudden, out of the clear blue, or actually out of the night sky, comes mm -hmm. this UFO crashing to the ground. And uh, so we have something very unique in the annals of, of the history of UFO cases in this world. We have the United States, we have the government of a major world power going on the air, on the airwaves, making a formal press release that went through all the clearances that needed to go through, mm -hmm. saying, we have in our possession a captured flying saucer. Right. Now, that was a first, and that is one of the reasons that this is such a unique case, because before the, the curtain of secrecy that since then has been slammed shut on all these future or, or subsequent UFO cases, before that was put into effect and fully, completely developed out by the military and the government. Right. Uh, we had this this Roswell 1947 case. Now, a lot of people take the attitude of kind of, you know, why are you still looking at this thing that happened 62 years ago? Well, this is the why. You know, this is something that came right out of the blue, totally unexpected. The government was not prepared to deal with it fully in terms of trying to explain it away or disinform people, at least at first. And so this gives us a clear insight. It, it is like it is like the null setting for all UFO research that happened. Yes. You you want to reset everything through the Roswell event. Look at it closely from all angles, using the latest uh, technologies that you have at your disposal, and then that gives you clear insight in, into investigating other cases such as the two crash retrieval cases that Ruben and I have written books about that we're going to be talking about as we go along. Yes. You know, it uh, it really is incredible because they had absolutely no reason. There was nothing, nothing uh, to suggest that if it was anything other than what they originally said it was, for them to come out and say, we have a disc, we have a, a captured UFO, we're going to get to the bottom of this. There was nothing for them to. There was nothing there for them to come out and say otherwise. So uh, again, when it comes to the original reports, I fully believe the original reports. And anybody really looking at it, again, I keep saying this over and over, can see that it is all a sham as far as their explanations. That is absolutely for sure. And I was thinking when when you started your program with the ABC News broadcast where ABC broke in and told the entire country back in 1947 that a UFO had been recovered, that a flying saucer had been recovered by the U.S. military, I was sitting here watching the reactions of the folks gathered on this end, and Stanton Friedman 
it had been a while since he had listened to that broadcast, and and he there were even parts of it that even he, you know, it brought amazement to his face. We saw it in his expression. Really, and he, he uh, kind of shrugged me and and whispered to me that he wanted me to get him a copy of that. I was wondering if you have a chance if you could cue that back up and play it for the ris- uh, listeners because uh, we we were just in amazement ourselves at having you know listening to to the clarity with which it it became very clear what really was happening. Absolutely, yes, I can do that right now. As a matter of fact, with a few clicks of my mouse here, I can drop it right there. And uh, here we go. Let me just cue this up here one second. Headline edition, July 8th, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Late this afternoon, a bulletin from New Mexico suggested that the widely publicized mystery of the flying saucers may soon be solved. Army Air Force officers reported that one of the strange discs had been found and inspected sometime last week. Our correspondents in Los Angeles and Chicago have been in contact with Army officials endeavoring to obtain all possible late information. Joe Wilson reports to us now from Chicago. The Army may be getting to the bottom of all this talk about the so-called flying saucers. As a matter of fact, the 509th Atomic Bomb Group headquarters at Roswell, New Mexico, reports that it has received one of the discs which landed on a ranch outside Roswell. The disc landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico, and the rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Rancher W.W. Brizel was the man who discovered the saucer. Colonel William Blanchard of the Roswell Air Base refuses to give details of what the flying disc looks like. In Fort Worth, Texas, where the object was first sent, Brigadier General Roger Ramey says that it is being shipped by air to the AAF Research Center at Wright Field, Ohio. A few moments ago, I talked to officials at Wright Field, and they declared that they expect the so-called flying saucer to be delivered there, but that it hasn't arrived as yet. See that? They, they talk about the, the flying saucer, the disc. They, they mention that several times. And if the, if the media is asking them, okay, can you describe the disc, and they're refusing to re- describe the disc, unusual. Well, uh, just letting that kind of soak in, that, that is an amazing series of, uh, of admissions by the, by the military and the government because a lot of that came, of course, from the official press release that was put out. That's right. And uh, so, once again, we, we are kind of on, on virgin territory here. This, nothing like this had ever happened in the world war at this level. And this is, this in point of fact is what makes the Roswell event kind of like the mother load of, of all UFO cases. Yes. And this is why year after year people gather here in Roswell, New Mexico around the 4th of July um, to, to mark or to, in observance of this incredible event such as there has never been before. And even though it has been 62 years, uh, it is kind of, uh, it, it's where everything began, and right. everything springs from it. Here's And uh, somebody, as a matter of fact, somebody here at the conference today was asking Ruben and me, uh, why did we think that there was such intense UFO activity in the 40s and 50s, and it seemed to have tapered off for a while, and, and even today it doesn't seem as much as there mm. was back in the 40s and 50s. And... My own uh, theory, and uh, Ruben can jump in here in a little bit, but my own theory is this was a critical juncture in human affairs, as we have talked about on previous programs. It was a time when it was the first time in the history of the human race that we have developed the capability to not only destroy ourselves, but destroy our entire planet and all life upon us. That's right. Never before in history had we had that capability. Uh, there was a tremendous number of UFO observations throughout uh, military installation, uh, installations throughout North America. Yes. And uh, 
there seemed to be a, a pronounced or intense interest on the part of these UFO occupants on the activities of humankind at this very critical juncture in the period of human history. Yes. And Ruben has uh, has some thoughts to uh, as well to share on that because uh, it, it's very clear that we were under uh, intense observation at, at that point. Ruben, uh, tell us what, you, uh, what your research has indicated. Well, you, you know, what's interesting, um, again, and again, I, I have to go back to Stanford Friedman. Uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, he, I mentor. And, uh, and but one of the things that, again, that was occurring, uh, we just finished uh, World War II. Um, people plus have died in that war. Uh, mankind and plus look at uh, uh, all the reports uh, from our uh, from pilots on both sides on the Axis uh, powers in the, as well as the U.S. Uh, where pilots were observing f um, so-called Foo Fighters mm -hmm. and yet uh, it's right after uh, the, uh, the the experiments with the atomic bombs in the Trinity site here in New Mexico which then uh, seemed to have started a flurry of, of of UFO observations right before, possibly bef uh, again before the crash, because I recall reading a number of, of uh, paper clips of sightings that people were already having um, in in that. So the the thing is that that the fact that here we have um, we're dealing with the, uh, with atomic bomb testing. Uh, yes. uh, our military is dealing with the power of the cosmos, basically. The fact that it's a destruction and it could lead to, lead to the extermination of our human race, perhaps that might have been another thing. Is that well, again, you know, we're we're throwing out a warning sign, uh, or there, or these extraterrestrials that are doing our surveillance. Says, these people, these we'll call uh, if if they are to be civilized, yes, they are uh, dealing with something that uh, perhaps they can't control. It, right? Thank right. you, Knowing yeah. out. Right. You know, there, there's something that was very interesting in the broadcast, in the ABC broadcast that, I, that I, I picked up on, is all of the information that they had was coming directly from the official press release that was put out. And even though they would decline to describe the disc, right, they also said in the broadcast, the missile, did you notice that? They also mentioned missile in the broadcast. So to me, to me, it was almost as if though they gave a little bit of a a, a morsel of information of what it might might have looked like. It might have been a disc, like an oblong oblong disc, like what uh, we've seen reported in the past. Well, that's interesting because Ruben and I just visited the Robert Goddard Museum, which is right here in downtown Roswell, and we were looking at some of those early rockets that were being tested by Robert Goddard, who is considered the father of modern rocketry. And, you know, uh, a lot of what you might consider, you might call a rocket or a missile, wouldn't necessarily be in the shape that most of us would think of as, as being a rocket or a missile. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there are many different shapes, especially in those early designs. There were many missiles missile shapes and rocket shapes so it, that could just barely merely be a reference to uh, some type of, of flying object or a projectile that goes across the sky yes I, I, it, it may not be and I'm just saying it may not be indicative of what the actual shape of the object was true very true very true yeah it's uh, Jack yeah go ahead uh, something too that I find really interesting in the uh, press release you know the, remember they coined the word flying saucer Right. Remember, yeah, how he described it. We got to remember that uh, Kenneth Arnold, uh, back uh, in, in June of 24th in 1947, they, um, they he described those objects as flying discs, and that was that was the term that was really being picked up, right, uh, uh, or as a coin word by the media. And then several weeks later, there you have the uh, the, the Roswell crash, and then they're, they're using the same description, right. flying saucer. Right. Very very true. Very, very true. All right, we're at the top of the hour, so we got to take our quick break here. And uh, when we return, we'll, uh, we'll go even further. Stick around, everybody. It's live from Roswell, Ruben and Noe. And uh, we'll be back right after this. Stick around. Stick around. 
Now think about this. Let's put ourselves in 1947. Right after the war, right? The beginning of the Cold War. And at that particular time, the nuclear power was at the top of the list. And, and, and rocket technology was acquired from the Germans. But let's think about this a little bit. News report comes out that in Roswell, New Mexico, where they launched, <laughs> they launched the attacks on Japan with nuclear technology, suddenly that facility has in their possession possibly alien technology. Now think about on a national security level what that would what that would mean especially to the russians because we didn't know what the hell was going on in russia we were sending up balloons to search for to listen for nuclear tests much like what's going on in north korea right now so here we are we've got our hands on some technology from another world or another dimension or definitely just not from this planet the report comes out hits worldwide news they quickly need to put that in containment maybe that's one of the reasons why maybe it has nothing to do with the um, oh social uh, social consensus of uh, the world or the country or what have you that it's strictly because of that now let's take a look at the technologies that came to rise very quickly right after 1947 interesting things indeed my guests tonight Ruben and Noe are joining me directly from Roswell we had Stan Friedman joining us and we had the wonderful director out there from the Roswell Museum Julie was also there they have uh, Stan lost his they, they've lost Stan's luggage and he's been there a couple of days and they can't seem to find it hmm convenient maybe Ruben and Noe welcome back Thank you. Yes, thanks. It's, uh, it's all very interesting. We were sitting here talking during the break about uh, one of uh, one of the my, our favorite quotes that Stan Friedman um, always uses or uses a lot of time in his presentations about Roswell is that um, the technology, the advanced technology that we see exhibited by these flying craft that we refer to as UFOs or flying saucers, that technology, whoever possesses that technology here on Earth, would certainly be uh, the power to contend yeah, that's with right. on the whole planet. And so um, it becomes, I think, it becomes of extreme, paramount importance for the uh, whoever these beings are who, who uh, pilot, who design these these crafts that we see all uh, around us, it becomes paramount for them to make sure that their technology, to a large extent, doesn't become available to us, okay. given our warlike nature and our history of killing yeah. millions of, of our own people for the sake of territorial battles or political right. ideologies or theological arguments. Whatever the case may be, we have a, a sad history of killing our neighbors for little or no apparent reason and for us to suddenly be connected with this incredible technologies that that we see uh in these in these craft um, would be devastating i That's think right. uh so there might be some uh some ideas that have been gleaned from some of the uh, crash retrievals that have taken place and from observing the uh, motion of these craft and so forth. We may have gleaned a little bit of that, but uh, I think uh, as a whole, uh, there, there's a real reason why uh, we shouldn't, as a species, at least at this point in our history, ha have a complete disclosure of, of the technology involved uh, these uh that we observe in these, I, in these craft. I, I Don't agree you agree with, you. with that, Ruben? I, I agree with you wholeheartedly on that. 
Uh, you know, I I was just thinking uh, there, uh, Captain Jack. Um, in our uh, research uh, with on our second book, the other Roswell, where we had Colonel Willingham, all this object crashed in the Mexican uh, on the Mexican side of the border. We got a really interesting call, um, and it's, it gave me a, a little more perspective of what was going on. Uh, we had, to, you know, you got to remember that the 509th um, uh, was um, in Japan, um, and they were, do, do, and remember the B, the B-29s were the, all the number of missions that were flown over to to uh, bomb Tokyo and all the other cities. Uh, yes, to get Japan to surrender. I mean, what was interesting is that um, all these people from General LeMay, um, um, Blanchard, all these people were involved in World War II. They really had a very, very tight network because um, they worked together. And when, uh, I got a phone call, uh, and, then, uh, and, we, and, and then I um, uh, contacted Noe that said, there's a gentleman here whose father was the uh, commander at uh, Carswell Air Force Base. And the gentleman told me a little bit more about the history about his, his father and that, um, how closely, how they worked closely with the generals. And he said that, that his father told him about Roswell, actual incident, back in 1962. Mm-hmm. But he was aware of this, uh, that his father had told him and Yet uh, they kept it secret, um, and that yet yet here we. Captain Friedman's book didn't come out till 1980. Yeah. yeah, the first book ever written, the first book ever written about the Roswell case did, was not published until 1980. That's right. So so for this gentleman to be saying that his dad uh, had had revealed the story to him in 1962, well nobody was seriously looking at Roswell. The the whole Roswell case had vanished from the public eye. That's right. By the, by the 60s, and so for him to say that he had he heard it from his dad, who who was high in the military, is an amazing uh, every. Yeah, and the fact that uh, you know going back, these guys uh, they knew each other, they protected each other, and um, obviously, if one general uh, had a add some sort of hot potato and said, hey, I need some backing here. They're going to back each other up. So That's right. that might have added to this reason why we had su- such a cover-up, because you had a very tight uh, working group that goes back to again, uh, World War II. Um, so it, it's an eye-opener, but it's uh, something that it, it adds a little bit more to, to this whole puzzle or, or that yeah, as we're trying to seek more answers to this extraordinary event. Do you think that, uh, because we know that the, uh, the military has come out with several explanations of, for Roswell. We know this. Um, and each one has been different from the next because they keep trying to plug the holes. And they just have a hard time plugging all the holes, really. Because every explanation they come out with, you know, guys like you and guys like Stan, they, 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 <laughs> they, sh- they shoot it down hole. easily. Because they're like, well, no, that doesn't, that doesn't jive. Do you think that there will be more explanations, or do you think that there'll ever be at least something that falls into line with the research that has been done on this particular case? Even if it's not an admission that there was a downcraft, and even though, and even if it's not a a pure denial that a craft was retrieved, do you think that something like that will ever come out? Well, I think the strategy here that has been adopted is uh, waiting for everybody who had any involvement whatsoever in the Roswell 1947 case to unfortunately pass away and no longer be available. Yes. And we're getting close to that. And so by a process of attrition, the hope is, I'm sure, that eventually the story will just go away. But the problem is that documents keep surfacing, um, Witnesses uh, who were young at the time of the 47 uh, event and, and are now older, they, they have memories of what their parents or relatives were, you know, how they were related to the, to the case. Mm-hmm. And, um, for example, just, just a quick example, uh, under the Freedom of Information Act, an FBI, FBI document that was released not too long ago, 
makes reference to the the flying disc that was recovered at Roswell. Uh, it was sent by an FBI agent uh, out of a field office, I, I believe, in Texas. And so the the problem with this uh, approach of hoping that the story will just go away is that it isn't happening. Right. Sixty-two years later, it remains vivid in pe- people's memories. New documents uh, and more witnesses keep uh, popping up, right. and it just will not go away. So uh, whether there will ever be any kind of official... Um, Admission. Uh, perhaps, you know, what UFO researchers live in hopes of is that one day a magical document or set of documents will finally be released. As so many UFO files, uh, secret UFO files, are now starting to be released by national governments around the world, mm-hmm. we've heard of the United Kingdom releasing its uh, part of its secret UFO files in the past few months. Uh, other countries, uh, France, uh, Canada, number of others are starting to release their secret UFO files, or at least part of them. Uh, we know that uh, there's still suspicion that they're holding back the really good stuff. Yes. And, and a lot of what they're releasing has huge portions that's been, that has been blacked out. That's right. That's but, right. Uh, we're, hoping, what we're hoping with Roswell is that eventually the magical document or set of documents that really tell the complete story and fill in the blanks, which we already suspect, and a lot of people already suspect. If you, if you come here to Roswell in, in July for this event, see hundreds and thousands of people lining the streets. Oh, in a certain regard, you can consider them all as truth seekers. Yes. I want to know if someone extraterrestrial or in origin or otherwise someone not of this earth has made contact with mankind uh, through the downing of a, of, a, of a strange craft here in Roswell, New Mexico in July 1947, and they're all seeking that. It's, an, it's important to the human psyche, psychologically, um, grips yes. with such earth-shattering topic. Yes. You know, here's something that's very interesting, because I've, I've often thought about this. Um, whenever it comes to something like Roswell when uh, uh, damn it I, I, I'm so repetitive with this uh, comment tonight that whenever you again whenever you start really looking at it and you look at the explanations and you look at everything you know you just it just it hits you it's so damn clear that there was a cover up that there's just way too much information that points to that the original stories were real but again I think that even if even if the the holy grail of of information were to come out about Roswell, the holy grail of all holy grails, I think that we would still want more, and that is just a a, a testimony to how important this story is. Yes, uh, yeah, definitely, I, I um. There, uh, Captain Jack. Uh, you know, as I'm listening to you, and then I keep thinking, uh, I of a of a story that one of uh, one of the people came up to my table was saying. You know, he said, um, I'm, "I've been hearing different stories out there." He said, "What? What if it, it was a plane that carried an atomic bomb and a crash out there in the field, and then they didn't want to release that information?" I said, "Oh, that might have been the first broken arrow incident." But you know, you're starting to hear these little uh, different stories. Yet uh, I still keep thinking, well, wait a minute. You know, look at all all the other testimonies from other people. The fact that that we had that there were witnesses that actually saw the aliens, actually saw right. the bodies. Right. You can't take that away. Right. I mean, you know, but you're gonna you're gonna probably be hearing these other theories or other people down the road that try, that will try to pay, pull away from the main. Story, yet it still comes back. Yes, yes, and and you know even, talk, even if it yeah, was you, uh, about your sense of you're feeling a sense of irritation and frustration as as we all are about this case because it's it's like a sleight of hand. It's like being pushed into a hall of mirror. Right. Uh, you know that something is real, and yet suddenly you've been thrust into a situation where you you kind of question whether 
did that really happen or not? Right. See, if, if something happens and people know that it's true, you have little hope of erasing that from people's memory. 62 years later, people still remember what happened here in Roswell. That's people right. People know that something out of the ordinary. So the only way, if you're trying to make that go away, if you're trying to make that truth go away, the only way you have of trying to accomplish that is by a massive campaign of disinformation, mm -hmm. trying to make everybody believe that what really happened did not really happen. That's right. It's a slight of card tricks. It's, it's a fantasy. A fantasy world is created to try to explain it all away and make everybody just feel as though nothing really happened. And, and that's what causes in all of us this sense of frustration. Right. And that, uh, that happens to this very day with sightings that we have. Let's take the Phoenix, Phoenix Lights, for example, or, or even Stephenville. They they really just kind of came out. Oh yeah, you're just you're seeing flares, or you're you're seeing Air Force jets, or or you're you're seeing whatever. I mean, even with our sighting here recently, um, that all of us here at the studio saw, we saw this massive damn ship come over the studios. And the next day, whenever I went around to the local areas around here, I mean, it's a rural area, but there's like stores and bars and little places all around through here that I went to to kind of just put out flyers and say, hey, if anyone saw this uh, last night around this time, give me a call. And the, the some people would come right out and see, you know what, no, I haven't seen that this time, but I've seen it before, or they've seen something else, and others are kind of like, so, you're a UFO chaser, huh, you know? And, and they look at me like I'm crazy. And then I start thinking, well, gee, you know, in a sense, I mean, I talk about this subject almost every night. At, at that, that little bit of skepticism, the look that you get, and the way that it's handled, the reaction, it makes you not want to say anything almost to some people. That's right. And that's why the Roswell incident is worthy of so much more study, even, even more than 62 years worth. Yes. Uh, because the Roswell incident points out to everybody that the emperor has no clothes. <laughs> Plain and simple. Yes. It's right there in front of you that's sticking it out at the end of your nose. The emperor has no clothes. You can try putting all the clothes that you want on him to make him disappear, but he's yep. right there. Right. Standing uh, like on the day he was born. <laughs> That's a disturbing image, Noe. <laughs> you know, I was just thinking, just or the emperor is wearing a tight-fitting uh, spacesuit. Yes, <laughs> or at least a thong. Or I'm in a thong, at least. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. It went very well, well put, because we have all of these reports all from all over the world, not only to the current day, but going back in our history, even to ancient times. Um. You, you compile all this together, you compile all this together, and you, without a doubt, there's something else going on. And if with the government stance of saying, there's nothing to it, it can all be explained away, and then, but yet you have people being watched, you have people, uh, you know, being harassed, like in Roswell, you know there's something a hell of a lot more to it. And going back to the broken arrow concept of what if it was a plane that was carrying a nuclear bomb out there? Well, the military didn't know about it. Uh, that, that, so if they've got a plane flying around out there carrying a nuclear bomb and it crashed and they didn't know about it, well, someone's majorly dropping the ball, and I just don't see that type of thing happening. There was something very, very credible about the information that caused the entire military to go out there convene on that location it wasn't project mogul it wasn't some weather balloon it wasn't what they described it wasn't crash test dummies like they said it was something with significance to to have that type of mobilization yeah that's exactly right and um one of the things that's that's very interesting for ruben and, and myself is uh, we kind of uh took on these two crash retrieval cases that we've written books about because both of these, uh, the uh, social story goes, happened along the Texas-Mexico border, one in 1955 involving mm -hmm. Colonel Robert Willingham, who's still living today. He's in his mid-80s. And he, he saw 
A UFO come across the sky. He was flying an F-86 fighter jet over West Texas. Saw that, that bright glowing disc come across the sky, and then uh, he received permission to follow it, and he did. He chased it toward the U.S.-Mexico uh, border, and then he saw it go down and crash land uh, just across the, the Rio Grande River into, into Mexico. So there was an involvement of another government immediately because of the crash occurred in Mexican territory. Yes. Same thing with our 1974 uh, book about our 1974 incident called Mexico's Roswell, where a small plane and a UFO uh, collided near Presi uh, just south of Presidio, Texas, along the Texas-Mexico border. Also, uh, there was an attempt by the Mexican government to make that recovery. Uh, it failed when all the soldiers from Mexico died of unknown reasons. Yes. Uh, possibly due to exposure from something in the in the crash debris. And then the U.S. subsequent to that came in and took took control of the UFO debris in that one, uh, according to the story. So in these two cases, we were hoping to kind of gain some leverage in terms of uh, information by virtue of the fact that both of these cases involved another world government other than the United States. Because a lid of secrecy that slammed down on these cases after 1947 Roswell was just amazingly tight. Yes. And it prevented, you know, then the game plan was put into place of the disinformation campaigns that trying to make the facts appear to be false, the rumors, the ridiculing people who report UFO cases. All of that came into play after 47 here in the U.S. That's right. But, uh, you know, Mexico didn't get that memo. And so studying these cases that involve the Mexican government it has put us in contact with uh, witnesses and officials from the country of, of Mexico, and, and it has been very enlightening. And there's been data that we've been able to gather that we possibly could not have gotten here in the U.S. Yes. So uh, those, these two books have been an adventure. You had Roswell-type had an angle, uh, and, and one of the things that Julie Schuster said a while ago is that she loves having researchers from other countries, uh, South America, Mexico, and so forth, come in and speak, because they bring a fresh new angle into the whole UFO problem, that a lot of times, you know, uh, researchers here in the U.S. don't have access to a lot of this information from their, their government. That's right. That's absolutely, that's absolutely true. Absolutely true, and we even had um, we had uh, pilots that were that had been dispatched to chase these things in the sky as they're being tracked, and a lot of them didn't come back. A lot of them didn't come back at all. There's very few, right? Actually, uh, again, it goes back to what was it going in, in the fifties and our. Examples of our jet fighter pilots that were ordered to uh, shoot these things down, and um, like I mentioned before, I think in, at, at another program, uh, both Noe and I were, were looking into this and the fact that these guys were well-seasoned fighter pilots from uh, World War II in Korea. Right. Um, I, you know, and, and there's some there's other other researchers that are really looking into this, and I think we're going to get some extraordinary information on this. I agree. I agree because it's definitely ongoing, and uh, I think that even years from now, we're still going to be uncovering things that we never knew about. We'll talk about that and more. We're at the bottom of the hour, so we have to take a quick break. So stick around, everybody. It's live from Roswell. We'll be back right after this. Stick around. Here we go, everybody. Badlands Radio broadcasting from the deep black heart of Texas. I'm your host, Captain Jack. Tonight. We, uh, our guests have included Noe Torres, Ruben Yarde, that are still with us, Stanton Friedman, and of course, of course, Julie, the lovely director out there at the uh, museum in Roswell. Fantastic, fantastic lineup tonight. All of this, I wanted, and I wanted to say this, um, all of this has been a fantastic coordination between Ruben and Noe and my producer, Celine. So all three of you, thank you so much for making this a great program. Thank you so much to Stan and Julie for uh, participating in tonight's broadcast. It's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, from the emails that I'm getting, it's been uh, everyone's just absolutely enjoying it. They really, really, really 
uh, are enjoying it. Let me tell you that. Um, two oh. things I wanted to say is right after the broadcast tonight, we will be rebroadcasting our uh, last year Halloween broadcast with both Ruben and Noe, uh, The War of the Worlds, The Real Invasion of Earth, which uh, well, that's coming up right after this program. Uh, which a lot of people enjoy. It's one of the most downloaded uh, archives that we have, as a matter of fact. And uh, we'll be rebroadcasting it again here, uh, right after the program. So, Ruben, Noe, welcome back. Hey, listen, uh, Captain Jack. We have here one of the most premier uh, Roswell investigators, Mr. Don Schmidt, who's been uh, researching this, and uh, he, he just dropped by, and we were, uh, would like to... Uh, uh, have him on on, on the radio here uh, with you in a few moments. And he's right, he's right here. How you doing, Don? Hey, Captain Jack. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing better than I deserve. Uh, it's good to have yeah, you on. I just happened to be passing by and saw like a party here in <laughs> Julie's office, and uh, very but, nice. But uh, the town was pretty quiet, so there's more going on here than uh, anywhere else. So. Yes, yes. Well, that's good. It's good. To, it's good to bring you on here uh, for the uh, for the broadcast. Tell me, um, how how are things been for you in uh, Roswell thus far? Well, we have a updated version of our Witness to Roswell book just uh, coming out. Yes, and we uh, have expanded it a hundred pages and about fifty new witnesses. We. Uh, Actually, even since the, we submitted the manuscript, we probably have come up with probably another two new chapters as uh, we continue to you know track down every final witness we can on this incident. Yes, yes. Because, uh, as you know, and as Stan always puts it, we're racing with the undertaker. That's right. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely true. We talked about that not too long ago, as a matter of fact, that a lot of the witnesses, of course, uh, the time, the clock is ticking. And, and, and new information keeps coming out and keeps coming out about this particular case that is instrumental in, in getting down to the bottom of it. Well, we believe it's certainly the granddaddy of all of them because it certainly contains all the elements of uh, what one would hope to Acquire as far as investigating any one UFO case. Yes. Because we're not dealing with just a fleeting glimpse of something in the sky. We're talking about the government actually having in their possession the physical proof. That's right. That we've all been striving for. And, you know, in just one fell swoop, just one announcement, the mystery could be, you know, ended for all time. That's true. And as I pointed out to a, a CNN reporter just a few months ago when he asked me, now Don, why is it that you've spent all these years, you've devoted 20 years to working on just this one case? Why are you doing this? <laughs> I looked him square in the eye and I said, because you won't. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. He uh, did not take it <laughs> too well, but uh, the, the truth hurts. Yes, it does. Uh, we're doing what they refuse to do. That's true. That's absolutely true. And you know, a lot of credit goes a lot, an enormous amount of credit goes to each and every one of you that do this because a lot of the funding comes right out of your own pocket. Absolutely. And, and that is that is, you know, anyone that says, "Oh, they're doing it for fortune and fame or they're just we're trying to no. No. I don't buy that at all and 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 thankfully enough, even many listeners of this program, they know the truth to that too. They whenever they hear these explanations, and like Stan says, the noisy negativist, it, we know we know that it's a bunch of crap. And uh, my hats off to you because you guys do some fantastic, fantastic work. We uh, one hopes to uh, break even <laughs> at the end of each year, and still feel that it was an effort worthwhile. Um, you may know we've we've already had three archaeological digs at the crash site. Yes, uh, the first one in 1989, and fortunately, each time it's been sponsored, it's been funded by whether the Sci-Fi Channel or even the Center for UFO Studies out of Chicago, which was the first one. Yes, but needless to say, for something as simple. That's because you're bringing in the manpower, and you might bring in some of the special equipment, 
and you might have a black hole operator come in to actually trench and unearth, uh, turn over the ground, that type of thing. You're still talking about fifty thousand dollars. That's right. Per project. That's right. And at the moment, we're planning on the next one, and. I'm not soliciting. I'm not all trying to raise funds. I just know that when we're ready and that uh, I've done enough lectures and we've sold enough books, it will happen. That's right. That's absolutely And so it, it hardly is, uh, well, honey, I hope, you know, if this works out, we'll remodel the house or put the addition on, because I don't know any ufologist that is doing that. <laughs> uh, I challenge anyone to show me someone who truly has become rich off the subject That's right. because again we're basically doing someone else's job the media supposedly at one time was our public watchdog yes and here we're talking about a major cover-up really the cover-up of the millennium of what we consider to be one of the biggest stories of all time and as i even suggested to one of the officers from the uh from 1947 I complimented him on his patriotism mm -hmm. and his ability to keep his security oath after all this time. Sure. And after he thanked me, I then said, but Colonel, what gives you the right withholding it from my generation? All of us who weren't even born back at that time. Yes. You people have decided for all time, what gives you that right? And his response? And he went, I've never thought of it that way before. Oh. And then he thought for another moment, and then he said, I'm still not going to tell you anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still not going to tell you anything. So we try. Uh, he was also the same officer that, after he profusely denied he was even at the base at that time in 1947, uh -huh. as we were leaving his residence, he walked us out to the car, and he said, Boys, I, I have to know. Should you find anything that does threaten national security, you will keep it to yourselves, won't you? Oh. And we looked at one another, and, well, well yes, of course, Colonel, yes, yes. And we got in the car, and we went, he knows everything. That's right. He knows everything. That's right. That's absolutely true, because if with a statement like that, I mean, this is a point that was made earlier in the week uh, when I was talking with uh, Glenn Schultz. Um, we said if, if you're being watched, if you're hitting on things that are really sensitive. As a matter of fact, um, uh, Robert Hastings. Robert Hastings had a great conversation with Stanton Friedman that he was telling me about. And he asked Stan, he said, uh, have you ever had like strange things with your phone or, or, or anything like that? And Stan said, no, 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 I've never had anything like that. And uh, Robert said, well, I have over these past years. And, and Stan said to him, he was like, well you got to understand something. You're in a completely different realm than I am. You're dealing with the nuclear aspect of it, the UFOs over nuclear uh, silos, uh, over, over uh, uh, facilities. Um, they're going to keep an eye on you. Now, if all of this was a bunch of hoopla, they wouldn't cover things up. They wouldn't watch the people like they do. They wouldn't clam up like the story that you just told me. No, I, I, and I couldn't agree more. And you mentioned Robert Hastings, and, and Robert actually used to uh, join us during our you know, bi-monthly excursions here to New Mexico. He would come down from Albuquerque, and mm -hmm. he would actually work with us and uh, has been a good friend for these past 20 years. Yes. But, um, I, I would agree with Stan that, especially in Robert's case, in working specifically with the actual intrusion, the infiltration of uh, nuclear facilities and the possible uh, dismantling and disabling of, uh, of you know, ballistic missiles mm -hmm. right here over our, our homeland, that certainly they would be paying attention, especially if Robert's speaking to certain people who may be whistleblowers, people right. who may actually be divulging certain nuclear secrets right. in, in the actual capacity of describing a UFO incident. Um, I think in our case, they're, they're watching, and very often, I'm sure, as we expose a new witness or two, they're scratching their heads and, and going, how did we forget about that one? How come we didn't <laughs> know about that individual? <laughs> yes. so, 
in many senses, we're actually doing their work for them. <laughs> That's very true. I can't tell you how often, after the fact, we'll go back to this particular individual, and they clam up. They won't speak to us any longer. Yes. The wife will pick up the phone and say, my husband has nothing more to say to you. Huh. So the next the question we ask is, who called your husband? Who talked talked to you after we left? That's right. That's absolutely true. Because, like I, I mentioned earlier in the broadcast, is is there there still can be pressure put on individuals that know that have knowledge um, that is key that people are all looking for. Um, if if there's something that surfaces in a news article or a television broadcast or a radio broadcast of someone starting to inch towards the the line that's been drawn in the sand. And it really appears that suddenly the pressure comes down from whomever. We never, we can never tell. That's correct. Hmm. Yet I, I, I still maintain that because the problem is in any other UFO case that the government has actually officially responded to as they have regarding Roswell. The fact that they're, and it's quite simply this, the fact that they're up to four official explanations after these past 62 years. Yes. I mean, I defy any husband to try that coming home late, you know, with his <laughs> wife sometime. Uh, you know, he'll strike out after the second one. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> and yet, even after the last Pentagon press conference, a reporter who finally stood up and said, now, what if the public doesn't believe this last one, the ant- anthropomorphic wooden crash dummies? Yes. And the, the Pentagon spokesperson, you know, just very calmly responded, well, then I guess we'll be back here in another few years offering another explanation. Uh-huh. Very, so to very them, telling. it's it's clearly running out the clock, That's stalling true. for time. That's true. So that final witness is passed on, and it's cover-up complete. Yes, absolutely. There again, that's where we come in. Because as long as we provide an opportunity for these people to have one final chance to, you know, publicly confess what actually happened. And I can, again, I can assure all your listeners, no one up to their deathbeds is saying this was a balloon, wooden crash studies, a rocket, an airplane, anything short of it being extraterrestrial. That's right. And all we need is one eyewitness in a court of law to convict somebody for life in prison. And here we have more than a handful of witnesses to this incident. Hundreds, precisely. That's right. And and it's it's, it's still it's 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 incredible to me. It's frustrating to me. It really is. Well, yes, it is frustrating. But frustrating in the sense that if we were, you know, you know, coming across a lot of contradiction, a lot of different storytelling, if the government wasn't paying attention, if we weren't speaking the witnesses, for example, one case, and five minutes into the conversation, all of a sudden we hear all the earlier conversation being played back to us. Yes. I mean, clearly it was very intentional. We're listening, boys, right. you know. Just, uh, you know, be careful. We've been told, we were told by a colonel at the Pentagon one time that the moment you start getting too close, that's when accidents can happen. Oh. Well, uh, it was something we decided on from the very beginning, though. You shine enough light on your activities. Yes. You remain as publicly vocal and outspoken as you can, that then, if an accident should happen, and we're all young enough that. If something happens to Don Schmidt overnight, all types of red flags go up. Yes, absolutely. I think I've, I've covered my backside well enough that it's now a case of, if just as with our witnesses, if they take any action, if they threaten or intimidate or, or harass any of our people, it clearly demonstrates we're going in the right direction. Absolutely. Like the Provost Marshal, Edwin Easley, told us, when we first talked to him, and this was in 1990, and he kept saying over and over again, I'm still sworn to secrecy. I can't discuss it. Now, this is in 1990. Hmm. And then we would follow up six months later, and our first book came out, UFO Crash at Roswell, and he had seen it. So he knew which direction the witnesses were taking us. 
and we said, Colonel, can you at least tell us if we're going in the right direction? Yes. Which he responded, well, let's just say you're not going in the wrong direction. <laughs> well, Very well. coy way of, for him, you know, not only telling us you're correct, you're right on the mark, but Godspeed. Yes. yes. Helping you in the best manner in which I can. Right. Which is which is really interesting because the the encouragement is well encouraging to have the people that know information to say you're not going in the wrong direction, keep going. It's almost it's keep going. Yeah, right. it reminds right. me of when I was a kid and we didn't play uh, hot and cold, you know, you're hot, hot, cold, cold, cold. They they, they knew where it was. They knew where it was, but they just to kind of guide you in a way, okay, you're, you're heading the right way, you know? And you still have plausible deniability. That's I right. didn't tell them anything. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> well, Witness to Roswell is the book, correct? Yes, thank you. And yeah, the new, uh, the revised, updated. That's right. Uh, it's newly released. Mm -hmm. And uh, Edgar Mitchell. That's right. Apollo 14 fame did our forward. And uh, George Norrie was kind enough to do uh, our afterward. That's right. That's right. So, as a matter uh, of fact, uh, your publicist uh, was kind enough to send over the book. As a matter of fact, I was just reading it this morning, as a matter of fact. Well, very good. Well, <laughs> let's uh, definitely try to do something as far as an entire show. That's right. My, sometime in the future. My Get producer back. actually has you on the list because she went through each and every one of the books and uh, she's got it all set up to contact each and every one of uh, the, the book authors, and you are in the list for, uh, for a full program. Very good. Very cool. I look Very forward good. to it. Be safe out there in Roswell. Have a great time. And, again, thank you so much for being on the program. Thanks, Captain Jack. And we'll do a whole show in the near future. I look forward to it. You bet. Me too. Ruben Wait. Noe. Good night. good night. Ruben Noe, you guys... Uh, Always, always a pleasure having you on. Anything else you want to throw in before we run out of time? We are just thrilled to death, Captain, that you were willing to uh, have this program with us. We heard from some fantastic people. It just has blown my mind again to be here in Roswell. Yes. And I'm sure, Ruben, you've, uh, you've, we just I, can't. can't I'm, I'm just to totally work. amazed how these shows come out, uh, Captain Jack, the, the opportunity to, to be on your show and just uh, to share with the audience, your listening audience, um, our research, but the fact that uh, we're here with some great people. And, yes. You know, I, I remember flying into Albuquerque in a thunderstorm, our oh. very first MUFON symposium, and I thought, oh, my God, this plane's going to we're going to, we're going <laughs> to, I was holding the book, uh, UFO Crash in uh, New Mexico, uh, UFO Crash in, in Roswell, and that was Don Schmidt and, uh, a book and that uh, that he actually had, had co-authored. So, you know, what, what, it's just a, it's just it feels such an honor being among these great people. Nice. I want to throw one one last thing in here, Captain. Uh, sure. Don, Ruben, and I are about the only people left in the in the UFO museum uh, right now, oh. and it's kind of an eerie feeling because uh, it's there's all these exhibits that have to do with extraterrestrial contact uh, yes. with Earthling. Uh, there's a uh, there's an alien autopsy um, a scenario uh, right right next to where we're we're broadcasting from, and it's and it's all uh, the entire museum is dark, and it's, it's there's an eerie feeling <laughs> of of uh, you know dating back to or, or uh, hearkening back to the 1947 Roswell. Yeah. Okay, so I, I just thought your in, uh, listeners would find it interesting that uh, we have uh, the unique experience of being here at the UFO Museum in Roswell, New Mexico, late at night, uh, talking to, to all your radio listeners. Knowing um, I they can say. find more information about our research at roswellbooks.com. Uh, we'll be happy. We have a place there where our listeners can contact us, uh, anyone interested in more information about either the Roswell case in New Mexico or our own uh, research into UFO crash retrieval. So yes. uh, once again, thanks for having us on. You know, I got to tell you this because my producer told me about this last month. She said that uh, she's like, "Hey, I talked to Noe, and uh, we got this great thing lined up, and it's going to be in July." Now, I was supposed to be on vacation starting July first, and I was going to be on vacation for all the month of July. 
whenever I heard about this, I said, cancel my vacation. I'll just keep broadcasting and take it another time just because of tonight. That's how important it was to me. That's how much. Well, next time you're going to have to take your vacation, but also make it a working vacation. Come here to Roswell. (laughs) We'll broadcast live from here. How about that? That is an excellent, excellent idea. We will definitely have to do that. We're actually putting some plans together to do things like that, and I can actually spread my wings a little bit and get out of this damn office. (laughs) Get out of your cave. (laughs) <laughs> you nailed it on the head because that's exactly what it's like. It's like a cave. Last night I had a scorpion fall off the ceiling onto the mixer board while we were broadcasting. So, <laughs> yeah, good fun around here. Guys, thanks so much. Enjoy your time. Uh, it's great having you. What a great program. Thank all of you. Tell Stan thank you. Tell Julie thank you. Don, thank you. All of you, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Have, Have a, a great good night. night bye bye. Wow, you know, I got to tell you, what Noe just described in that museum, lights are all off there in the middle of the night, gave me chills. And I'm sure it gave all of you chills, too. What an experience. All right, folks, we'll be back tomorrow night. We're going to be talking Bilderberg from all the way from China, by the way. Hmm. We'll see you tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, all the way till midnight.